Jonas. I am the Sales and Relationship Manager here at Asia Exchange, and uh, I'll be your host for today's webinar, uh, the theme of which is studying during the pandemic. Uh, and we'll be discussing a little bit about uh, tips from Asia Exchange and uh, current students studying abroad uh, during the pandemic at various Asia Exchange locations. Uh, the agenda for today is uh, that I will shortly update you on our current policies during the pandemic. Um, I'll give you a short destination update on most of our destinations, and then we will have a short panel discussion with uh, current Asia Exchange students. And last but not least, uh, we will have a Q&A session where you're free to ask me questions or some of our panelists as well. And uh, feel free to post those questions uh, in our chat, uh, starting, for example, now. So if you have any questions that you want asked, uh, feel free to do so. And I know that there's uh, a lot of students going up or looking to go abroad during the autumn 2021 semester and beyond. And uh, hopefully there's also a few of our partner universities and other partners uh, that we're currently dealing with in the audience today. So welcome to you guys and also welcome to our panelists today. All right, let's kick it off. So a little bit uh, about our current policies during the pandemic. Um, of course, we're overall looking to be more flexible uh, than we would be under normal circumstances. Uh, and what this means is that all students are able to postpone without extra costs, as we know that there are um, different types of surprise situations coming up and situations can change very quickly. Uh, we're also is issuing cancellations and refunds up to one full refunds up to one month before uh, semesters are starting. And we're also currently in the process of also extending our application deadlines for all our um, current uh, destinations in our portfolio. And uh, those should be updated if they haven't already onto our website in the coming few weeks. Then of course, we've also um, strived to ease our document requirements uh, for all together with our partner universities, meaning that uh, we know that, for example, international offices uh, at your home universities might not be open uh, or other institutions, uh, for example, if you have to have take a TOEFL test or something, that might be a little bit more difficult at the moment. So uh, some of these document requirements at various destinations have been eased. Uh, secondly, we have a constant categorization of our destinations and countries uh, in levels one, two, three, and four. Uh, and we've also added our beyond abroad destinations, meaning destinations outside of Asia, uh, and currently, our newest destination, for example, is in Central America in Costa Rica. Um, last but not least, uh, this may not be your plan A, it may not be your plan B, but it could be your plan C. Uh, we've also implemented exchange hubs together with our partner universities. What does this mean? Uh, this means that if you're not currently able or if you're not able to travel to your original destination, for example, in the upcoming autumn semester, uh, you could choose to travel to one of our other destinations, attend a campus there, one of our partner universities' campuses, and uh, complete online studies to your original uh, university. And of course, uh, a general overview here of the pandemic situation currently at hand, as we can see, uh, Southeast Asia, when compared to, for example, uh, most of Europe, um, as well as the US, is uh, doing quite a bit better than uh, than these other destinations. But let's get on with it. So uh, I will be going over um, the categories uh, of destinations in uh, category one, two, and three, and four uh, next. And then uh, we'll have our panel discussion with uh, our students. So uh, the category one destinations um, are currently destinations that we feel are safe bets for students to travel to uh, during the autumn semester and have been safe bets during the whole duration of the pandemic. And what this means is that teaching has been partially on campus, at least partially, if not fully on campus at some of these destinations. The pandemic situation has been constantly under control and traveling into the country has been possible for the whole duration of the pandemic. These destinations would be 
first of all, South Korea. I think we can all agree that that has been an exemplary destination in terms of handling the pandemic situation through strict immigration procedures, 14-day quarantines, effective testing and tracing of the pandemic. And uh, currently, our both host universities, Hanyang University and Hankook University of Foreign Studies, are hosting their classes in hybrid model, uh, depending a little bit on depending a little bit on uh, the size of the classes uh, and the amount of students enrolled in each course. Then next up, we have Thailand. This is also a category one destination, similarly to South Korea. They are uh, they have very strict immigration procedures and a 14-day quarantine, similarly to South Korea as well. And classes have mostly been uh, taught in a hybrid model. For example, Kazatsart University for the spring semester is fully held on campus. Last but not least, uh, I wanted to include Sardinia in Italy, which is one of our newer beyond abroad destinations. Maybe some of you uh, feel like it's a little safer uh, to go somewhere closer to home if you're studying uh, at a European destination currently. And uh, the maybe the, uh, the the best thing to update about Sardinia currently is that uh, it has just been declared a white zone, meaning it is also opening up because Corona cases are falling uh, there generally, and uh, the classes are being taught in a hybrid model. And these three destinations are actually where our students uh, today who are join, joining us, joining in, joining in us uh, as panelists are studying in. So uh, feel free to ask any questions related to these destinations or any other destination. And I'll uh, be sure to try and answer as best I can. Moving on to uh, the category two destinations. These are destinations where COVID is still a little bit more prevalent and uh, there are stricter measures on campus currently and uh, classes are mostly held online. And these destinations are currently Lisbon uh, in Portugal. So European University of Lisbon, our partner university there is currently teaching uh, classes in a hybrid model uh, where students are rotating weekly in and off campus uh, and then one week they'll be on campus and the other week they will have classes held online. There's strict measures on campus so students who are attending on campus lectures have to go through uh, testing, there's uh, temperature measurements for example and of course uh, masks are required on campus as well as in public spaces. And travel to Lisbon is currently possible, but movement inside the country uh, in between the different provinces, provinces, for example, is currently restricted. Then we have Costa Rica, our newest destination, where we have our partner university, Ulasit. Uh, over there, uh, mandatory masks and a health form is required to be submitted on arrival into the country. However, uh, Costa Rica is, of course, a very uh, tourist dependent country in terms of their whole economy. And thus, in general, uh, of course, they have tried to make it possible for students as well as tourists to currently enter the country during the pandemic. Um, but of course, they're taking measurements inside the country to keep it safe for all travelers. The classes at Ulasit for the upcoming semester are held online, but for the autumn semester, they are they are currently planned to be held on campus fully. Last but not least, we have Dublin, Ireland, and our partner university, American College Dublin. Um, the latest updates from this destination is that uh, there's a 14-day quarantine as well as a PCR test that is required to be taken before uh, you depart for a semester abroad in Dublin, and the classes are currently fully online, uh, but the cases are actually dropping specifically in Dublin at the moment uh, because they've been able to uh, issue vaccinations quite effectively. Then moving on to our category three destinations. Uh, these are destinations where teaching is currently fully online and uh, travel restrictions or visa restrictions for students are currently in place, meaning it's impossible to travel into the country at the moment as a student. And uh, online studies uh, are currently possible from these destinations, but you have to complete them from outside the destination in itself. Uh, these countries are currently Bali, Indonesia, where we have Warmadeva's Univer Warmadeva University's WIP program and Urayana University. 
So it's no student visas are currently being issued and classes are held online. But uh, you can also, for example, take these from our uh, exchange hub in Thailand, attend uh, the campus there and study online uh, to one of these universities listed. Similarly to Bali, uh, Malaysia uh, and our partner university there, University Putra Malaysia, is uh, not issue or uh, Malaysia is not issuing uh, the student visas and the borders are not open for students. However, our partner university is uh, offering online classes for students also studying outside of the destination. Last but not least, we have Shanghai University in China, where of course travel is not possible at the moment, but similarly to our uh, Bali and Malaysian partners, the uh, online classes are offered, for example, for students attending our exchange hubs in Asia. Then uh, last but not least, we have our category four uh, destinations where there are no online courses offered, no on-campus courses offered for exchange students currently, and where you're not able to travel currently as an exchange student. These would be uh, Bali, Bali's uh, uh, BBF program hosted by the Warmadeva University and uh, Undik Nas University's exchange student program. Uh, then in addition to this, Taiwan uh, has closed its borders and they have actually been closed ever since the pandemic first started. And unfortunately, they have not been offering any online classes for our exchange students. However, of course, the pandemic situation has been very well controlled uh, due to the uh, lessened amount of travelers entering the country there. Last but not least, we have uh, Vietnam and our partner university, Foreign Trade University, uh, which we opened uh, during the pandemic, one of our more new partners in Asia. And uh, unfortunately, Vietnam has been closed since March 2020. And uh, they are actually in the process of opening up their essential businesses and effectively vaccinating locals there currently. So um, in that sense, this could be a destination that may open up for the autumn 2021 semester later on. But unfortunately, uh, currently, no online classes are being offered for exchange students. It's good to also keep in mind that even though the categorization of our destinations is currently what it is, uh, these situations can change quite quickly. And uh, we currently have a COVID updates page or landing page for on our website. You can check the uh, page out. We're updating that weekly and the categorization of these different destinations may change weekly or even monthly. And it's good to note that there's still a long time until the uh, autumn semester takes place and different situations at these destinations could still develop. Uh, also, we were also we will be asking you to um, answer some of our poll questions if you if you want to. So uh, please feel free to answer some of the uh, questions that will be popping up. And uh, I have Ida here in the background as my co-host. She will be also revealing some of the results uh that we get during this webinar from our polls thank you Ida. then last but not least before we move on to our panel discussion i wanted to mention that uh our webinar calendar for spring 2021 includes a lot of different destinations you might be thinking of applying to or have already applied to so if you're interested in uh, knowing a little bit more in-depth information uh, in the upcoming months before your semester abroad, be sure to uh, register for some of our webinars. You can find those at asiaexchange.org slash webinars. But at this moment in time, I'd like our panelists to please uh, unmute themselves and maybe you could start uh, by introducing yourselves as well. I see Megan is already online. Here we have Alexis and Tim joining up as well. Hello, everyone. Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you well. Perfect. Perfect. Hey, so um, we have Megan. You're studying at Hancock University of Foreign Studies currently. We have also Alexis here studying at the University of Cagliari for the second semester in a row. And then we have Tim studying at the University of the Thai Chamber of commerce in Thailand at the moment. And I thought it would be interesting for especially our uh, students 
going abroad in the upcoming semesters to hear a little bit about uh, your current experiences studying abroad, but also what type of preparations you have made uh, for your semesters abroad, what the arrival process has been, uh, your destination. And uh, maybe we could actually start by talking a little bit about the uh, pre-arrival preparations that you have made, as well as uh, your arrival into the country and your experiences with that. So maybe um, we could start at the top. Uh, Megan, would you like to talk to us a little bit about what type of pre-travel um, preparations you had to make before uh, going to uh, for going for your exchange semester in Korea? Yeah, sure. Um, so. Basically, the most important thing is to get the visa. Um, so I think I applied um, for my visa in December and I got it like mid-January. Um, I flew here in the beginning of February, so it was enough time. Mm. Then I would say it's important to get a credit card if you don't have one and maybe inform yourself about which credit cards work because I had some issues with mine, but it, it all went well. Um, then I also got some cash uh, beforehand, just in case my credit card wouldn't work. And a lot of other students did that as well. And basically it was a, a very good call to do that. Um, then basically I got a SIM card before that to just be able to do like to make calls and stuff because at the airport, they ask for your Korean phone number a lot. And if you have a SIM card, you can get this Korean phone number. Um, and yeah, like the most important thing otherwise is to get a PCR test. You have to get one which is like valid um, 72 hours before departure. And that's basically the thing they always, always look at. Like they don't look at the visa that much, but at the airport, they looked like three times at my uh, PCR test basically. So yeah, that's, that's the most important thing. Yeah, I think I would add one more thing to this list, which is uh, relevant also in pre or was relevant also in the pre-pandemic era and is relevant right now whether the pandemic is there or not uh, you also have to have a tuberculosis test taken if you are staying in an on-campus or off-campus dormitory currently uh, at Hoofs. can you uh, yeah. confirm that as well Megan or are you staying yeah. in the dormitories at the moment no no I'm in a dormitory um Basically, a lot of students did that at home, but I actually did that at the health clinic, which is right next to Hofs. So basically, it's like, it's, I think, um, 15,000 won or something. So it's like around 15 euros. Um, and it's really quick. Like, it takes five minutes or something. So you can basically also do it here. Yeah, very good point. Very good point. Hey, Alexis, uh, would you like to pitch in about uh, your arrival and your pre-travel um, preparations to, uh, or when, when, when studying in the uh, University of Cagliari. For you, apparently, of course, it might be a little bit different as uh, you're traveling inside of Europe. So would you say that the pandemic, for example, um, affected your pre-travel preparations? Yeah, um, hello everyone, first. And um, as many students of the first semester we were applying to go to Asia, like for me to Bangkok, but um, the border closed and all the situations that we know now, so we were, you asked to us like, if we want to go to Calgary. So we accepted like me and like, we were 10 on the first semester, something like that. And uh, for me, it was really simpler because I'm uh, from France and traveling to Italy is not that hard because like um, the phone numbers are working as the same, credit cards are the same. Uh, the only problem we had problem, uh, it was just to do a PCR test um who was not controlled every time it was like a bit laxist about it but it's still better to do it even for yourself and to fill some documents about um the reasons of uh, the venue in italy uh, and like the um, learning agreement i had to to have it with me in the plane uh, and after the biggest difficulty i had here is uh, in italy you have like a fiscal code uh, it's like your identif identification number and you have to do it. And in Sardinia, the office of it is really far from the city. So, and no one is talking English there. So it was a bit complicated to do that. Yeah, but I'm sure that's also an experience that kind of makes you grow as well when you have to uh, be in a foreign country, maybe speaking a foreign language as well. So in that sense, uh, good, gro good growing opportunity for you as well. Do we still have Tim on the line? 
Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you, Tim. Welcome, welcome. Uh, would you like to uh, talk a little bit about uh, your preparations when going to study at the uh, University of the Thai Chamber of Commerce in Thailand? Yeah, so um, it's actually quite similar to Korea, um, but uh, unlike before, uh, for Thailand, you not only need a visa, but you only need a, uh, also need a certificate of entry, which you will get after you have your visa. Um, and so the whole process takes a little bit more time uh, than usual. And um, so you should start early uh, because for me, it was uh, one and a half month until I got everything. All right, um, that's definitely useful uh, information. Yeah, uh, don't do it by email. Uh, just call the embassy or um, send them the documents. Um, and uh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I would also like to mention here that Asia Exchange is also in constant con uh, constant contact with multiple different embassies, for example, in France and in Germany. But uh, we do not have the power to affect visa issuance, though we may have information on visa issuance. So. If you want to, you can always call us. You can always um, send us an email and we'll be sure to help you out as well. But uh, the most accurate information uh, you can find out by calling your local embassy. All right, so we have gone through a little bit about the uh, pre-travel preparations you had, but what about the arrival into the country? I think that's also um, quite a process to go through, especially in terms of, for example, Korea, and Thailand, where uh, you have the quarantines, uh, if I remember correctly, also get tested during uh, your arrival into the airport. Uh, so would Megan want to start again and uh, talk a little bit about your arrival into the country? Okay, um, so arrival was interesting. Basically, you're like in a plane and your whole time concept is like messed up. And um, after like going out of the plane not even really being in the building they check your PCR test and then you um, just like kind of are guided through different steps through the airport and the first steps are all um, have to do with quarantine because you need to do two weeks of quarantine um, and because we are long-term um, long-term stayers basically we can't um, do those in hotels so we need to like book an Airbnb or something mm. And basically, they then check your temperature, they check your PCR test again, um, they want some documents that you filled out in the airplane. So basically, it's a lot of bureaucracy, but in the end, you don't have to do a lot because like the Koreans can speak English, but they are not as fluent. So they don't really question you why you are here or something. So it's basically just um, a very... Yeah, very um, automated automated process. And basically you get through all those steps. They install the, they have an app where you need to monitor your symptoms. They install it with you. They tell you everything you need to do. They give you certain forms and everything. And in the end, you are helped to find a taxi that will bring you to a test center. And then you basically do a PCR test. Um, and then the ta taxi will bring you to the um, accommodation. So for me, it was an Airbnb. And then basically they um, will text you and will call you if they want to know anything. Um, and then you need to do another PCR test like two days before you go out. So basically you don't really have to worry about much because they will contact you and they will tell you everything. And if you don't have a phone number, they usually do it over Kakao Talk, which is like the WhatsApp in Korea, or they will just call your Airbnb host. So basically it's it's very organized, but it's kind of a lot when you arrive. Yeah, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And I think one good thing here to mention is uh, is that the uh, the transportation that you take from the airport to the health center, as well as your accommodation, is special. So you're not allowed to take just any taxi, but uh, you need to take a special transportation uh, that will transport you to the quarantine location. And during your quarantine, you're also as, as Megan mentioned here, you will, down, you will be downloading or you can download it before you actually arrive into the country. But uh, if you do not download it before you arrive into the country, the officials at the airport will help you download this uh, quarantine app, which will be used to contact you during quarantine 
And uh, Megan, did you have to, for example, measure your temperature uh, multiple times a day, for example, during quarantine? Yeah, so we had to do that like twice a day and then just like put down if we have any symptoms. And it was very convenient because they also have like a messaging um, tab where you can just like message them. And then like two hours later, like that's the highest they ever waited. Then they just like call you or message you um, and tell you what you need to do if you're like unsure about something. So, yeah. 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 What about Tim? How does the, um, does it, does the quarantine uh, differ when arriving into, uh, so not in South Korea, but into Thailand? Um, so it's quite similar. Um, actually, when you get out of the plane, um, they won't let you alone until you are in your womb. Um, but uh, also, if you're staying long term, uh, you have to do the quarantine uh, in a hotel. And um, you are not tested at the airport at arrival, only two times during your quarantine. Um, yeah. but basically, they do it very strictly um so you couldn't even deliberately um get the virus um because they are paying so much attention and at the airport you just have to have to show them some some documents um the, the same documents that have already been required before for multiple times yeah and it's good to know here that uh these are actual actually normal hotels offering rooms for quarantine uh, for, for example, students traveling into the country. And if you're wondering where you can find these uh, hotels, you can contact us. We can uh, hook you up with a list of multiple different hotels offering these uh, quarantine services. What about uh, Alexis? It must have been a little bit different for you with no quarantine. Um, did you just enter an accommodation? That was it? Or how did it go for you? No, we. I just had to do my COVID test 72 hours before coming here. And uh, the only time you can have a quarantine in Sardinia if uh, it's uh, if you are coming by boat by ferry from Barcelona or the south of France, but here we don't have like quarantine or stuff even since the, since September. Yeah, so. gotcha, gotcha. All right. Hey, uh, I know that for example, Megan has just arrived into the country with the with the semester starting on March second. And uh, well, Tim has been there for a while longer, and Alexis has been there already for uh, one semester before the uh, this semester that's on right now. So, uh, what would you say the everyday life is there like right now? Maybe Alexis, you could start uh, this time. Um, the uh, the everyday life was um, a bit uh, a bit simpler at the start because uh, Sardinia was pretty much closed. we were in the first lockdown. Uh, so all the people who wanted to come here could don't, but they uh, starting reopening on the last summer, like all the clubs and stuff. So all the partying people came here for doing parties and stuff and bring COVID again. Um, so in September, the situation were, was still good, but we had like some uh, curfews, the bar closed, the restaurant closed, uh, the university was closed when I arrived in I will go there uh, tomorrow for the first time so, since six months. So it's pretty pretty nice now. And the uh, situation is going better and better each day. So now we are living pretty much normally again. We, for sure, we have to wear the mask, be cautious with the people we, who are frequenting and stuff. But the, the situation here is starting to be clear again. And it's a real pleasure. That sounds really promising. That sounds really promising. What about Tim? How is the situation in Thailand? Um, yes, yeah, so like, um, unlike what I hear about most of the European countries, um, here it feels like the whole virus situation is coming to an end. Um, there are very few cases, and um, if they are detected, um, they get traced back uh, very strictly. Uh, there are about zero to 150 uh, cases per day compared to a few thousands uh, in the bigger European countries. Um, there are some restrictions, but um, like I can complain at all. Uh, the bars are open, the restaurants are open, um, nearly all the shops are open. Uh, they just have to close at 11 or midnight. I'm not quite sure. Um, and 
uh, travel inside the country is allowed again. Um, but uh, yeah, especially here in Bangkok, uh, the situation is really getting better and better. I don't know about most uh, of the, the other tourist destinations, um, but the situation is getting better. All right. What about Megan? What's your first impressions in South Korea? I um, think uh, in, our, in our panel discussion that we held as well in last autumn, we had Haney, so a student uh, studying at Hoofs there as well. And her comment at the time was that if it weren't for the masks, uh, she would not even know that the pandemic uh, situation is, or that there is a pandemic in South Korea. But what's your initial reactions? Yeah, basically, I would say if I wouldn't watch the German news, I wouldn't know that there's Corona. <laughs> Because um, in the end, I don't know how Seoul was before coming here. So like before the pandemic. So basically, I could like say that um, the the constant wearing of the mask can also be like a cultural thing. So because sometimes we have like a lot of air pollution or something. Um, so basically, you could also say maybe it's like just being aware of health conditions or something like that. Um, so basically, you wear the mask everywhere. So even if you're like walking through a park by yourself you still wear the masks and everyone is actually wearing the mask um but everything is open basically so there are even clubs open so you can go clubbing so so it's just like they open at 5 p.m and they close at 10 because there's a curfew so at 10 everything closes you can still be outside but everything closes um and there's this rule that basically you can only be four people when you go into a restaurant or something and when you're outside, you can be five people. So that's kind of the only restriction that's kind of bothersome in a way because you want to meet everyone. And then it's really hard to be like, OK, but we can't meet any more people because we want to go eat something. But like, really, I can't complain. It's just like um, so nice here. You can do everything like even even just the thing that there are convenience stores that are open 24 seven. So basically it's like nearly midnight here in Korea, but I still could go out and just like get ice cream or something because there's like, life is still, life is still going on here. It's so completely different to Germany. Freedom, so to say. Hey, um, what about the class, uh, the class uh, organization? How has that been going on, for example, in South Korea? I know that uh, Hankook University specifically is organizing their classes depending on the amount of students that are currently enrolled into a certain course either on campus or off campus do you happen to have any classes on campus Megan? um no not really it's a little bit sad but um basically it's that depending on the social distancing level that so has they're gonna change if it's online or offline so basically um i think right now all classes that have more than 20 people have to be online and all that are below 20 can be offline. So I have a friend who's like doing a master course and they are just like eight people, so they can do that. Um, but right now everything's online. It's fine, basically I'm used to it from Germany, but um, I think maybe it's gonna change when the numbers are gonna go down even more. What about, uh, so from my understanding, Alexis, uh, you will be starting your classes on campus shortly, am I correct? Uh, yes, I have a presentation with my uh, university tomorrow with um, where they will say to us how it's gonna go and how much we will be by classes and stuff. And um, it will start in presential, fully presential in two weeks now. So- Okay, that sounds really good. What about Tim? How are the classes organized there? Are they fully online or do you have a hybrid model or what's the um, situation? They, here they are. Um, I would say that most uh, classes take place on campus, um, but um, in a hybrid system. So there's a, there's a Zoom meeting and uh, the, camp, uh, the class on campus at the same time for many courses. Um, some take place only uh, online. But uh, yeah, um, it's nice that it's on campus because um, I, personally, I also made a lot of local friends and not just other exchange students. So um, yeah, really great situation here. Yeah, that basically sounds like 
a normal study abroad experience for you then uh, meeting both local and other exchange students on campus. So yeah. that's very great to hear. Very great to hear. Hey, but actually the um, agenda for today and the meeting duration was set to 45 minutes. So we do have 10 minutes left uh, to take some questions from the audience, whether those are for uh, myself or for our panelists here. And uh, I will shortly just stop sharing my screen here and check our chat here and see what type of questions we're getting. So let's see. Um, I'm accepted to the uh, BBF program on my graduate studies for the autumn 2021. And my alternative is Costa Rica at Ulacit, but what is the chance you will have that as a graduate student uh, for the fall 2021? Uh, there is a possibility that uh, there will be graduate level courses offered at Ulacit. Um, nothing we can promise yet, uh, but something we will definitely be working towards uh, in the future. And in general, uh, for example, if you are a bachelor student, and Bali happens to be closed, definitely uh, Costa Rica is uh, a good choice as an alternative for, for you. Uh, it seems um, also Ida is answering some of the questions here in chat. Uh, if students wish to study at Shikchi and university, do you suggest they apply or should they forget that destination and apply elsewhere? Uh, as mentioned, you can always apply to Shikchi and university initially, and uh, you can, for example, uh, mark down an alternate destination uh, for yourself. And if the pandemic situation is bad uh, or the borders to Taiwan are closed for the upcoming autumn semester, you're always uh, welcome to change your destination and we'll help you um, with consulting uh, a suitable destination for you in terms of your field of study or in terms of your interest in, uh, in destinations. Let's see, um, there's a question here. So you have to take the PCR test uh, three times. Would that be uh, the case for, uh, for uh, South Korea, Thailand, and Italy? How many PCR tests did you guys uh, take? I, take? I took three. So like, like one before coming, then right when I arrived, and then gotcha. in the end, one as well. Gotcha. Um, for me also three, one before um, before my travel uh, and two during the quarantine. So on day six and day 11 or 12. Uh, and me three because uh, uh, before coming, uh, because we had one case in our Erasmus group because we are going out with the Erasmus people and one to come back in France just for Christmas. Okay. Then there's a question regarding Korea here. How would one apply best for a PCR test 72 hours before departure? And what about the alien registration card procedure? Uh, Megan, could you answer about the PCR test? And of course, feel free to answer about the ARC if you have uh, experience in that already. Yeah, sure. Um, so basically, it depends really on which country you're from for the PCR. Um, because I'm from Germany, I did the one at the airport from the Centogena Test Center. Basically, those are your safest bets because they um, know what you need. You can get it in English, which is really important. And um, we had some issues at the airport with, I think, some French people um, because there was something not right. So I would always recommend you to ask the embassy what they know, what is like the best bet or to really do it at the airport because they those are the fastest and the safest. And you really, really don't want to skim on the PCR test because that's the most important thing. Um, for the ARC, it's basically, um, so for those who don't know, that's basically your Korean identity card here. So basically like um, your ID in other countries. And you can do um, an appointment by yourself and then go to the office. But basically, um, Hafs, the university I'm at, offers to do it for you. And it's just like, you need to pay like 15 euros extra. And basically like nearly all of us said, okay, we don't want the extra stress. So you just go in the office, they want a bunch of documents that you will get, you will have everything. Um, and then they basically will contact you when you need to do your fingerprints and tell you when it's done. So it's really simple. Thanks, Megan. 
There's a uh, question here for Tim. What are you allowed to do during your quarantine in Thailand? Are you allowed to shop for groceries or do you have to eat at a hotel restaurant, for example? And maybe it, I would be interested in hearing also some tips from Megan uh, in terms of her quarantine in South Korea as well. Okay, so um, basically you are allowed to order from 7-Eleven at most hotels. Um, that's like a supermarket that is everywhere in Thailand. And um, your food, um, so actually you um, uh, you chat with the hotel online. It's kind of WhatsApp, just people use it more here. And um, you get a link to, or to order your food um, every day. You order it, you, um, uh, you select what time you want to have it, and they just bring it to your door at that time. Um, and uh, you are allowed to go outside of your room um, to the hotel garden or swimming pool area for um, one hour a day after you get your first negative test results. But that differs from uh, between the hotels because, uh, for example, in mine, you could go outside two times a day. Um, so, yeah. Megan, what's your experience uh, compared to Tim's? So you can't go out. <laughs> um, so basically you have your Airbnb and um, you can't go out to buy groceries. It's always like straight from the airport to um, the Airbnb. For the second PCR test, you actually can walk there, but you need to notify your officer who's responsible for you. And you can't stop anywhere and buy anything. Um, because like the app is monitoring your position and I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't do it. Um, so basically a lot of people order takeout. Um, it's important to be in a certain region in Korea for that, um, to be able to use that. So um, there are like different districts, um, which Asia Exchange will also tell you. And a lot of us stayed in those districts. The safest bet is to get an Airbnb host who will grocery shop for you. So basically, um, when you pick your Airbnb, you should really try to get someone who's um, able to speak English and who can like will do shopping for you. Um, even just like you basically groceries are not not cheap in Korea, but basically that's the safest bet. Um, otherwise, you can order takeout. You can also take food from your home country. A few people did that, but then you have to like pack more luggage and that's more expensive. So basically, I'd say get a host who speaks English and who can buy you stuff um, because that's the best thing. And yeah, you're not allowed to leave in those two weeks aside from the PCR test. Um, so I recommend trying to find an Airbnb with a nice view because I had friends who stayed like in a, in a very small room with just like a window facing another brick wall. And that's not really nice. Um, so yeah. All right. Hey, Megan, uh, continuing on with you, there seems to be a lot of questions from South Korea. Um, are you currently living in the Hoof's dorm, uh, or if not, which dorm are you living in? Would you recommend staying in the uh, dormitories? Okay, so that's th that depends on what kind of person you are. Because I uh, stayed in dormitory A first, um, which is basically the girls' dorm, and it's all right, but it's very small. So um, you really have to get along with your roommate and uh, for me it was I lived with a girl who already lived there for like one semester so she had a lot of stuff and it was just too small for the both of us so I moved into dormitory C and because we don't have a lot of um, students at the moment compared to like the normal situation I actually have a double room for myself so that's very comfortable um, so that's perfect basically you have like a small kitchen you have um a washer and everything like that. So washing machine. So I would say if you're, if you're like comfortable with the idea of living with someone else and having like zero private space, then it's okay. Um, but maybe try to get a room by yourself. But if that's not possible, maybe check out if there are like maybe shared houses you can go into or the Airbnbs. But at the moment, because there are not as many students, I have a lot of friends who actually have a room for themselves. So it's kind of a lucky game 
but I think it's all right. Basically, you're going to be outside a lot of the time. So if you're not a person who needs a lot of personal space, then I think it's fine. Yeah, those are good points. And uh, I would like to mention here that uh, both at Hanyang University and, and at Poofs, uh, predominantly all our rooms uh, that you would apply to through Asia Exchange are all double rooms. So uh, in that sense, uh, it seems like Megan got a little lucky here with uh, double room all by herself. Um, last but not least, uh, for Megan, once again, how many months in advance to your travel to Korea did you start the application and preparation process? Um, so basically, like, uh, just for getting my courses um, to see, like, which courses I could have accredited for my university. I actually started two years ago, but that's, like, a lot. I really wanted to go to Korea. So basically, that's why I started planning so early. Um, but the application process with Asia Exchange, I think I applied in September and I came here in February. So I could have even applied later. I just wanted it to be set. So I think if you do it like four months in advance, that should be fine. Just like be sure to have like all your vaccinations already and stuff like that, because that is a bit annoying to rush it in the end. So maybe plan that beforehand, but otherwise it's fine to do it like four months. That's a very good point. And as like a general tip for everybody, especially during the pandemic, the earlier you apply, the more time you have for preparations uh, for your semester abroad. So please do take it, take that into account when applying. Um, before we do, before we end the webinar, we are one minute um, over time, but maybe I'd like to hear from each and every one of you, just a few tips on studying abroad during the pandemic. What would you um, recommend for uh, students going in future semesters? Maybe uh, Tim could start here. Okay, so um, definitely, um, whether it's in during a pandemic or not, but uh, learn some basic Thai because the, the level of English is quite low in most areas and you won't understand them, they won't understand you. Um, and um, so especially at the airport, even it can be quite difficult to, um, uh, to deal with everything. Um, so yeah, learning basic Thai, um, preparing for the quarantine, um, like, um, I don't know, choose, maybe a project, um, take some books with you or yeah, just everything you can, you can think of. And, um, for the rest, just don't have too much doubts. Um, I had them too, but now I feel like, uh, I'm extremely happy that I did it. Very good to hear. Would Alexis like to go first and we'll end with Megan. Um, for me, I think, um, yeah, just don't have like too much or too high expectations. Uh, all the things can happen. Uh, like for me, I, I was supposed to be in Bangkok, but so I came in Sardinia without any expectations. And I feel like great now. And just like uh, always, um, Take advantage of the time you have with people you have because like um, sometimes here we are like some weeks so we were all waiting like oh when the next zone will be there when the restrictions will be down and stuff and you have this typical thing that you are waiting for the better conditions but you are already great so it's just like taking advantage of the time you have every time every time every time thanks what would Megan like to add here um I also would um say the same like Tim said, um, learn some basic Korean because it's like you you will feel more comfortable, maybe even learn like um, the writing system, which is really easy. It's not like Japanese or Chinese. So you can learn it one day actually. So maybe do that because it's easier to navigate and um, learn a little bit about like cultural no-gos, like taking your shoes off when going into a room, you will feel more comfortable. And pandemic wise, I'd say, um, don't expect offline university. So like expect that you will have online courses, like get a good camera, get like the devices that you need. Um, 
yeah, but basically I'd say like Seoul is a great area to study during the pandemic. It, I think it will be still a very safe um, environment here in autumn. And um, I already said like in the chat, if you have any questions, I put my Instagram down. So just message me if you want to chat with me. And yeah. Thanks. And uh, at this point, uh, since we are already a little bit over time, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to everybody who did join today, uh, to both the students and our partners uh, who are here with us today to listen. And a very special thank you to Tim, Alexis, and Megan. Thank you so much for joining, taking the time to come in here and talk about your experiences. And as mentioned, um, well, you can contact Megan, it seems. It seems that Tim also shared his info in chat, but also feel free to contact Asia Exchange uh, if my further is by email, my phone, WhatsApp. And uh, at this point, I'd like to thank you for this uh, webinar. Please join our upcoming webinars. If uh, you're still interested in hearing more in-depth info on our different destinations, and uh, I'm pretty sick, and uh, hope to see you abroad in autumn 2021. Thank you, guys.